last minute for various things. So, but we are we do have the art. We're going to plan on archiving this and putting it up on the web so that we uh, people can download it. And yeah. so we're we're hopeful that that'll work out pretty well. Yeah, I'll probably just send John the presentation after. That's fine. Yeah, that's that'll work as well. Yeah, I've had a few that's asked for that as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's it's uh, whew, I can't even remember how big that file is, but it's not excessively. It's not too large to email, I don't believe. No, I've emailed it to like ten different people. Nine point three meg, so that's not too bad. That's something you can do. Yeah. If you get more requests, you can always forward them to me, and I can send them along. Okay. And I'll work on an overall spreadsheet of all the of all the attendees I've put together, and I'll send that to you either tomorrow or Monday. Excellent. So anyway, let's get this back up here, and it looks like we're kind of at a uh, stabilized equilibrium on the people calling in. And so what we'll go ahead and do now is, Aaron, you can start recording, and we're going to have the third session for the 2014-15 Weather Prediction Center's Winter Weather Desk Operations Verification Ooh. webinar, and this is presented by Dan Peterson, WPC Winter Weather Focal Point, and this session is scheduled to go approximately 30 minutes, and we have time for question and answer following that. So if you do receive any, have any technical issues, you can contact me, uh, send me an email. This is Brad Grant at WDTB. And I also will be monitoring the chat on the GoToWebinar. If you do have a question that comes up during the presentation that you'd like to uh, that you'd like to ask on any on any of Dan's points, and then I'll pass those along to him. Also, he'll be he'll be allowing a little bit of a break in between slides too, if you want to interject. But we're we do have a scheduled uh, oh ten minutes uh, quick Q and A after the presentation that will, that will follow on. So. Uh, uh, any questions by any, for anybody before we get started? All right, very good then. Uh, well, I want to welcome Dan Peterson then again to uh, present the webinar today. Well, thanks so much, Brad and Aaron. Uh, it's been such a help to have WDTP hosting these webinars. We used to post the preseason preview on our website, and we're getting so many more people now that DTB is putting out the announcements and hosting it and contracting all the um, arrangements for it. So I appreciate your help so much, and we're getting so much more interaction with the offices this way than when we used to. We just posted on the website. So anyway, here's the title slide and nice view of my home up in New York, where I grew up, and the you know, view of the Hudson River and the Catskill Mountains. Here's what we're going to cover today in the webinar, the Winter Weather Desk Forecast and Verification. And we're going to have some new membership of the ensembles used in the probability snow and ice forecast. And we've got a new collaboration tool for use with the forecast offices and us. And we're going to be starting some experimental days 4 to 7 forecasts that will be shared on our internal web page for you. Okay, first we'll just start with a quick review of what the desk does. For the last 10 years, we've been providing snow and ice accumulations to the forecast office. There you can see the internal website. The internal website will also be used for the Winter Watch Collaborator and also the day's 4 to 7 forecast. So after we send out the snow and ice accumulations, we collaborate the offices, and then we send out the probabilities for snow and freezing rain. And then at the end of the shift, we send out the low tracks when there's a reflection of a surface low for a given system. If there isn't a surface low reflection, then we won't send one out. And then at the end of the shift, we issue the heavy snow and ice discussion. And so what we're going to do is breeze through the winter weather forecast process, and I'll show you the blender that we use each day in composing the forecast, and then a little bit of the background of what goes into it or how the forecasts are derived. For precipitation type, N to N -tip for both the NAM and GFS give us an explosive precipitation type derived from algorithms. And we do not get that guidance from the ECMWF or Environment Canada or the UK Met, so we have to come up with our own and run algorithms through their temperature profile forecast. The options there in the blue are those that we can use for creating the temperature portion of the forecast for precipitation type, and then those options that are in the green are those that we can use for QPF. During our regional meeting, September 3rd and 4th, with Jeff Craven from the Central Region at the time, he's a Sioux in Milwaukee, uh, asked, why don't you just use 100% WPC QPF? And the answer is, right now, the QPF is not available when I'm composing the forecast. The 
QPF forecaster and the winter weather forecaster are composing their forecast at the same time. So we collaborate and say, what approach do you want to take? What way do you want to take? And then we run together. And so we're having internal discussions about possibly finding a way to do the QPF early in shift so we can adopt that approach where we can work towards using 100% WPC QPF right off the top. A lot of times offices express interest as to how much continuity is in the forecast, so we've added a continuity blender where I can blend in the previous forecast into this one if we want to retain continuity. And I have a range from 0 to 80% of continuity from the prior forecast that I can include in the current forecast. Okay, the idea is we use that blender, we create the accumulations, and then we send them out to you. And the folks at the forecast offices are hopefully ingesting them and displaying them in D2D and GFE. So you can see the snow, the freezing rain, the snow look ratio grids are available in six hour increments and two and a half kilometer resolution for ingest for the forecast offices. And so once we send out the deterministic snow and ice forecast, a script is run and takes our forecast, uses it as the mode or most frequently occurring value and assign the highest probability, and then combines that forecast with all the ensemble members and other models to come up with the probabilistic forecast. And at the bottom is the website where those probabilities are posted. Our Sue said there were some questions about talking to the WFOs about how the probabilities are determined and our role in the probabilities. So I just wanted to show this brief uh, two slide sequence where we look at the model distribution of forecast. It's in the green with the white outline now. We have the SHREF, the NAM, the GFS, the GEFS members, and the ECMWF operational run all together, put them together into the um, distribution function. And you can see in the orange-red, where in this case the WPC most likely deterministic value is shown in the orange star. And then you can watch as the peak of the distribution or highest probability gets switched over to the WPC forecast. And then this is the goal of our collaboration with the FOs. We need the WFO input to see if we're on target of what the most likely value is going to be. And so you can see how important what that most likely deterministic value is because the probabilities get skewed in that direction quite a bit. And so this is the same as the previous slide, except we've added the WPC forecast. So what's new for this year for composing the probability forecast? You can see in the orange-red, we added 25 ECMWF ensemble members that are randomly selected. They'll be different from shift to shift and day to day. I don't even know which ones they are, and I have no way of tracking them. However, the basic idea, you can see right underneath the ECMWF, there were 21 SHREF members that were included within the probability forecast, and there were 33 total members last year. So. The SHREF with 21 out of the 33 forecasts dominated the total distribution of the forecast. And wherever the SHREF skewed, then the probability skewed. And we needed to have a little bit more diversity and other solutions. So if the SHREF had a bad day, the forecast didn't have a bad day, too. And so we went ahead and added the 25 European members. And you can see at the top, we now have 58 different members that go into the ensemble for the snow, freezing, rain probability forecast. Also note, we have only five of the guest members. They're so coarse in resolution, they don't do much in the way of message scale banding in the forecast, and so we try to keep those to a minimum. I'm asking our developers to explore using some of the reforecast members, which are higher resolution than the native guest members within the forecast. So you can see at the bottom that the probabilistic forecasts are provided at 20-kilometer resolution. Western Region in our meeting back in September challenged us to provide these forecasts at 2.5-kilometer resolution like they do. And so our developers are busy about trying to figure out a way to accomplish that, and that's one of our primary goals since their next season is to improve the resolution of the probability forecast. And so within the new probability forecast, a lot of the offices use 12-hour heavy snow and freezing rain warning criteria. And so we've been asked to provide those forecasts in addition to the 24-hour forecasts we've done historically. And so these are going to be posted right after we send out the accumulations on this FTP site. And so I showed the text there in arrow where you can see the um, probabilistic winter precipitation forecast, or PWPF, 12 hours. And then you can see right below the 24. 15 miles an hour. Uh-oh. 
And so here's the display of the probabilistic forecast. You can see the probability percentile forecast and then the forecast durations, 24, 48, and 72. Eventually, 12 will be added to that, and the forecasts are all available in six-hour time steps. So if you want to look at the 12-hour forecast now, don't go to this site. Go to the FTP site from the previous slide. Which one is it so you hear? Now I'm going to breeze through the forecast verification. I have a lot of background slides with additional verification, so feel free to ask for others that I don't show here. This is the day one threat score over the lower 48 states, and we're doing a comparison here. You can see at the bottom of 4, 8, and 12 inches of snow, these are the threat scores, and in the yellow is the automated ensemble, which is defined at the bottom. It's a consensus of the NAM forecast plus the GFS plus the ECMWF Shref members and guest members that are in our probability distribution. Just add them all up and then average them, and you come up with your average or consensus total. And so we do that for all three days and then compare our forecast to this forecast. So our forecast is labeled as the final in the orange-red. And so you can see that we improved upon the ordinary ensemble for all three thresholds, 4, 8, and 12 inches of snow. And this type of pattern is very similar for days 1, 2, and 3, so I'm not going to repeat that. Previously, I showed the map of the surface low positions, and so here's the verification of those forecast surface low positions. You can see at the bottom, there is one verification for 12 hours, the 24-hour forecast, 36, and so on, through the 72-hour forecast. These are the RMS errors in nautical miles for each of the models and ensembles and also ensemble combinations. On the right of the index are the individual model ensembles that we're tracking. And in the royal blue is the GFS plus the NAM, and at the bottom in the green is the GFS plus the ECMWF. And so among all the individual models at 36, 48, 60, and 72 hours, the lowest errors are from the operational ECMWF, and then from the different combinations, it's the GFS plus the ECMWF just blending the two forecasts together. That provides the best overall forecast for the surface low position. I think here's the verification summary. We've added value in the deterministic forecast for snow for days one, two, and three versus the consensus-based automated ensemble. And just like last year, the ECMWF outperformed the other models with the surface low position forecast, 36 to 72 hours, with the GFS and ECMWF blend, the best performer. But they're actually very close. Okay, one topic that we've heard a lot from the last several weeks and months from regional and national headquarters is the importance of collaboration between us and the forecast offices. They don't want us to just be guidance. They want us to be in sync with the offices, and so we're looking at ways to improve our collaboration with you at the WFO level. And so our hours are very similar to what we had last year. We staggered back about an hour. Now at the medium range desk, we'll do the day's 4 to 7 forecast. And so you can see our phone contact here for operational winter weather and also QPF. And our conference call numbers will be pretty static throughout the year. And at the bottom, you can see on the desk focal point, and the acting sue right now is Mark Klein. And then later on in November, Tony Fercasso will be the acting sue. But the idea here is we want you to know we're available, and there's a senior branch forecaster on 24 hours a day, seven days a week during the hours in which there's not a winter weather forecaster on. Collaboration-wise, here's the time series from 2009 to 14, and what we're doing is tracking um, one, two planet correspondence and phone calls that we get from the offices. And on the left, you see with the WFO questions, the trending is up over the last five years. In the middle, comments that offices have made about the winter weather forecast, the overall trend is up from 2009 to 2014. And on the right, we're starting to see a pickup in phone calls that we get from individual offices. The greatest number are from those offices that are starting to do their own probability forecast. Here's our schedule on shift each day. I have the night shift here, and then in the background, I threw a day shift. You just add 12 hours, and it's the identical schedule. Just come in each day and review the forecast from 1 to 3Z, and then we compose and send the accumulations from 4 to 6 to 15Z. What I've highlighted in the orange-red color are the options that are new for this year. And so after we send the accumulations, the script will generate the draft probability percentile forecast and send them to you and post them to this FTP site. It's available for the forecast offices only. It's password protected, and no one else outside the Weather Service will see this. 
That opens up the collaboration window, 615, 815Z on night shift, and 1815Z to 2015Z on day shift. And once the probability forecasts are posted, then the script continues on and puts its output on, on the new winter weather watch collaborator, and that's going to start this weekend. I'm going to give you the website that you can look at it now if you want to. Um, it'll probably be turned on Friday since November the 1st this Saturday. And so that will be available for the collaboration period. And instead of just the deterministic forecast, you're going to get the deterministic forecast, the whole suite of probabilistic forecast, and then the winter weather watch collaborator, all for your review as you go through the collaboration process. So you're going to get a lot more output than you had last year from us. So at 8.15Z, after the collaboration window, we send the low tracks in discussion. And the key here at 8.30Z, we send the days one to three snow and ice probabilities. This means that you have a chance to provide input to change our forecast until this point, and then we finally send it out then. And at the end of the shift, at 10Z, the medium range desk will do the days four to seven test snow and ice probabilities. That will post an internal page starting on December the 1st. And so any questions or comments you have when you see those forecasts, contact the 29, eight, eight, range 30. Down. The wind was south at 12 at Kings Hill at 8,000 feet. It was 30. Somebody had the to put their uh, phone on hold. I hear the NOAA weather radio. With calm wind. Lewistown was partly cloudy, 31. Lewistown's probably Montana. Okay, good. Um, what's new for a collaboration? We're going to talk about the Winter Weather Watch Collaborator. That's based on the probabilistic winter precipitation forecast, or the PWPF. And it's there to enhance collaboration between WFOs and, and deciding whether or not they issue watchers or warnings. Um, and we're going to use this as a common objective starting point to facilitate collaboration between the offices and us. And so it's called the Winter Weather Watch Collaborator. It's a little bit of a misnomer in that it's a forecast that will be produced for all three days, regardless of what mode you're in. It could be pre-watch, it could be during the watch, it could be during the warning, or even after you've issued a warning. And so they're really just exceedance probabilities. So I'm going to show you how we compose these forecasts. And it's pretty straightforward. All we do is compare our probabilistic output, the probability of exceeding 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 inches of snow to the warning criteria, and then we figure out what the probability of exceeding your warning criteria is, and then we post the probability of exceeding the warning criteria. And so we'll just highlight on the map those areas where there's a high probability of exceeding the warning criteria. At the bottom, you can see the warning criteria were obtained through the regions. We wrote to each of the regions, and we got responses, except Western region doesn't track their local office criteria. So uh, each individual office has been sending me the accumulation criteria. If you'd like to submit yours, go ahead. I've gotten several, and several more are yet to submit theirs. The second step of the watch collaborator methodology is we will highlight an area where the probability of exceeding the warning criteria is greater than 50%, and that's where the reference to the watch comes in because the directives say you issue watches for greater than 50% criteria. And so we might call the warning collaborator if the probability was greater than 80% of exceeding your warning criteria. And so in this particular case on the left, the oranges and reds where there's greater than 80-90% chance of exceeding the criteria there near the Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio border. And then on the right, you can see the area that's mapped out where there's a high probability of exceeding the warning criteria. And we just do this for each time step through the forecast and continuing highlighting the areas. And so we compile them all together and then map it out for a 72-hour period. And so a strategy might be you might get on shift, look at the summary map, and then say, okay, is my area ever within the high probability of exceeding warning criteria? And if it is, then you might go in and start examining the time steps to see what period of time you have the highest probability. So here's an example of stepping through that particular forecast. This is back on March the 12th to the 15th of 2014 when it was a widespread heavy snow event from the Great Lakes across the northern New York and northern New England. So on the left, just go from top to bottom. This is six-hour time steps through the forecast. Again, the oranges and reds are the 80 90% probability forecast. And so high probabilities extend across northern Indiana to the Michigan-Ohio border, and then as you go through time into northern New York and northern New England. And then in the middle, you can see the summary map where there are high probabilities along that axis. And then on the right, you can see where the forecast offices had their watches and warnings and advisories in place at that time. So they're pretty well in sync with one another. It's a pretty well forecast event. 
And here's some other examples we wanted to cover what would happen in the event of freezing rain. You can see here in northwestern North Carolina there's a threat of freezing rain, so we had a highlighted high probability error there. On the right here, you can see what the individual probability, 60 to 70 percent chance of exceeding the warning criteria. And at the bottom here, Jonathan Blaze and Sue and Raleigh composed this map, and you can see the stripe of observed half-inch rain, uh, freezing rain totals there in northwestern North Carolina. Okay, now we're going to go over the functionalities that are on the Winter Watch Collaborator page. We start off with the upper left. There are two tabs, one for the 12-hour criteria, and then next to that there's a tab for the 24-hour probabilities. Just click on whichever one you're interested in. Below that, there are radio buttons. It will default to the summary map, and if you want to start examining each uh, individual 12- or 24-hour probability map, you just click on the radio button for snow or freezing rain. It will change to those forecasts. And down below that, you can see on the left there the zoom option to get into your area of interest. And then on the right, there's the refresh option. So if you're finished zooming in and you want to zoom back out, you just click on refresh. And at the top, the legend of each forecast will issue the valid period and also when it's issued. Sometimes there's uncertainty as to whether or not this is the current one or one from the previous shift. So when you see the issuance time, you know how it recently was issued. At the bottom, this is where the Collaborator web page output is right now, and we're going to link to this and display this on the internal web page. So this should already be working, and then we'll link to this um, Friday or Saturday on the internal website. Okay, here's the limitations. The Winter Weather Watch Club does not account for terrain-based criteria and also does not account for high-impact below criteria events, such as the first event of the season or during rush hour. We estimated the criteria for Western Region. I've gotten six or seven offices that have submitted theirs, and the more the merrier. Take a look at the map and make sure we're current. Um, there have also been a couple offices that have changed their criteria for this year in the Central and East. I got an email yesterday from Justin Arnott up in Gateway, Michigan, indicating the Michigan offices have also changed their criteria, so I need to make that update too. Okay, here's what's new for days four to seven. We're going to start generating experimental days four to seven forecasts to provide a probabilistic outlook for winter weather for use by WFOs. And when it becomes public, it'll be there for winter weather sensitive customers. We use both the probability of both QPF and frozen precipitation and multiply them to make the guidance for the probability of exceeding intensive and liquid equivalent frozen precipitation for use at the WFO, most likely in your hazardous weather outlooks. And so what we do is we take the forecast from WPC and the QPF from the GAFs and using WF ensembles and look at the timing and then produce this graphic of a probability of the QPF greater than a tenth of an inch based on all these ensembles and our forecasts put together into one cumulative distribution and probabilistic distribution function. And then after looking at the QPF, we look at the probability of frozen precipitation, again, from these available ensembles. They started with the gas and then during the season last year added the ECMWF ensembles and then later for this season we're going to add the Canadian ensembles. And so we started with the QPF. Now here we have the probability of frozen precipitation. And so we put them together to come up with the final forecast. On the left, the probability of QPF exceeding a tenth of an inch or so. Multiply it by the middle graphic, the ensemble probability of frozen precipitation, and then you wind up on the right, the probability of winter precipitation greater than a tenth of an inch. There are forecasts generated, one for day four, one for day five, one for day six, and one for day seven. And we'll be experimenting with different criteria over this winter, different freezing rain and snow criteria. My claim is a lot of people are going to want to know the breakdown of snow and ice and not just combined frozen precipitation. So we're going to see if we can break that down into snow and ice in our experiment this winter. As I mentioned before, we're going to combine the ensemble members of the guests and the ECMWF and the Canadians all together, and that will give us 90 ensemble members providing QPF and precipitation type guidance for this forecast, and then we add in our QPF. Here's a display of what the Days 4 to 7 forecast will look like on our webpage. Um, there's a possibility that our GIS contract will switch from Google to Esri, so depending on the fate of that situation, we'll provide the maps in, in either format, but there's going to be a GIS-type format display for the forecast for use at the FWFO, so it'll be implemented on our webpage. And again, that'll be 
implemented on our internal only web page. It, this won't be shared with the public and media or anybody else. It's there for your evaluation and go ahead and give me your comments and tell me what you think about it. Here's a summary of the presentation. The WPC's snow forecast add value to the consensus-based automated ensemble for all three days. Due to popular demand from the WFOs, we've implemented new 12-hour snow and ice probabilities, and those are going to be posted on the FTP site each day after we send the accumulations. We're going to do the new Winter Weather Watch Collaborator to enhance WFO WPC collaboration starting this weekend, probably Friday. And we're going to start a day's four to seven winter weather outlook that's going to be started and posted each day on our internal web page on December the 1st, 2014. And to let you know finally, we're here to collaborate. And even if it's not a winter weather forecaster on, there's a QPF forecaster on to help you out at any time, day or night. Okay, that's my perspective on the upcoming winter season and some of the new tools and resources we're providing. Several people have asked for a copy of my presentation, and so go ahead and send me an email if you want one to share it with others who haven't had a chance to see it or just for your own personal review. So feel free to write. Um, at this point in the conference, I'd like to open the floor for questions. I want to hear what you have to say and what you'd like to know. Hey, Dan. Hi. Uh, this is Daryl Massey in Nashville. Hi, Daryl. How's it going? Uh, good, good. Um, I had a question regarding the collaboration. First of all, I was wondering what shifts um, y'all work as far as um, uh, what hour to what hour up there. 